we're going to be talking with you all today about the difference Black history knowledge can make. And um, we've already had introductions, but this is us. Um, so we want to get started by um, actually asking you all to engage in a little bit of participation. So we're going to ask you um, a couple of quick questions around doing some polling as we move forward. But before we get to that, I want to talk you through what it is that we are actually going to be doing today. So our agenda for today, want to reflect on what our purpose is. And specifically, we're going to be talking about how we think about Black history knowledge as it relates to youth identity development and culturally responsive teaching, right? Want to give some thought to how we define, explore, and engage these components. And so we'll be providing some content. Uh, we'll also be talking a bit about how various psychosocial developmental factors are connected to Black history knowledge and positively impact psychosocial development for all students. And finally, want to give an opportunity for real uh, engagement and uh, practice in using some of the, the topics and skills that we talk about today. Okay, so our poll. Yeah, so this leads us to our first poll. And just again, if you're someone like me that likes to prepare for things, and if you're someone like me that's fairly introverted, eventually you might have to talk to strangers. So just prepare <laughs> your heart and mind for doing that engagement. Um, but before we do that, you won't have to say anything for a while. It'll just be the two of us. Um, we right. want to start with one polling question just to get an idea of what you guys value in teaching. Uh, we don't know you, we've never met you, don't know what's in your classroom. So we want to do that. Um, so we want to have this first question here. You can see, um, what do you value most in your role as a teacher? And there's a follow-up question after that as well. Um, so pick one of these um, that you would say is more priority for you when you're engaging in the teaching space. And I'll give you a second to read them and respond. So let's go to our second question. Same potential answers, but this one, we're asking you what you think is the, one of the least priorities in your role as a teacher. Um, I might be able to guess based on the responses from the first question, right. but um, right. choose one of these in terms of, you know, when I'm going into the, the teaching space, I don't really think about this as much, or if this doesn't happen, ain't no great loss there. So we see most people here um, really value student development and personal growth, which actually lends itself well to the conversation we're going to have today. Um, and also higher order thinking skills, which is also good. I think that's something I value as well as a, mm -hmm. as a um, faculty member. And then, let's look at our second question. So with the second question, yeah, we had a lot of others. So the, the, um, mm -hmm. the grunt work, I guess, if you will, of the teaching, um, is not so much a priority for other people. Test prep, what was the other things that we saw? Paperwork? The paperwork, the the uh, data crunching, the, I also oftentimes sometimes call that the thankless work. It's a lot of the work that happens behind the scenes and we as educators have to do it. A bit draining, that is for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but a lot of preparing students for jobs and careers, um, valuing least as well as um, facts and principles about a subject. So what it sounds like is, from what I'm gleaning just from these two questions is that the majority of you all, um, it's not so much about the subject itself, but actually what that leads to in terms of development and personal growth for the students, mm -hmm. less about facts and figures. Am I yeah. reading that correct? Would you say that's the same? Yeah, I would agree. And um, as Dr. Holman, you want to be Dr. Holman or Andrea today? It can be Andrea. This okay. I just, mm -hmm. And I, you know, Colette is fine. Um, <laughs> so I, I uh, absolutely resonate with what Andrea is saying. And I, and I very much think it fits well with what we're going to be talking about today, as, as Andrea mentioned earlier. And so when we think about this notion of um, Black history knowledge, much of what we're going to be exploring today is understanding how it is that individuals develop and uh, grow through a particular content knowledge area. A content knowledge area that I would argue, and I have um, explored quite a bit in my research uh, along with Andrea, is very much um, as much about content as it is about personal development and growth. And so I want to um, jump into it, actually another polling question, it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, 
around this idea of where individuals first learned about Black history knowledge. So we've got one, two, three, six different choices um, for you. And so go ahead and just pick where you first learned initially, if you can remember that far back, um, where it is that you first learned. If there's another option, feel free to put that one in the chat as well. But please, um, if you could pick from what, some of these. So here we have our results. Oh, wow, Bianca, you watched the entire Root series. Did that take you 10 years, 11? How long did that take? Forever. For, and she, oh, my, oh goodness. my gosh. Y'all just don't know. Mm, scarred me as a kid. Totally. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Killed me. <laughs> Killed me. And how old did you say oh. you were? I was oh, like, somewhat, when they were about seven. Second grade. <laughs> second okay, grade. it sounds oh, like wow. around the same time as. Uh, yeah. As Dolores, oh my god! And I goodness. never connected that he was like the dude from Reading Rainbow, and then I connected. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> it's so versatile. <laughs> yes, <laughs> wow. Okay, um, and then on the other end I of the spectrum, as a kid too. let's see. Scott feels kind of uninformed, so you didn't watch. Okay, it. okay. Uh, yeah, and you wow. know that level of variability is what is going to make today so rich and. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a part of the reason that we get excited about doing these kind of talks is because it really opens up our opportunity to cross pollinate, share experiences, to learn from one another. Mm. Okay, let me stop the sharing. Cool. Okay. Good, good data here. Right, and sure. I'm just loving what's happening <laughs> in this chat right now. I'm trying to Love like, it. okay, I'm coming back. So. <laughs> absolutely love when data are consistent. Mm -hmm. We have seen and we're seeing in the poll that very much most of you talked about learning Black history knowledge, at least initially, in school, right? Now, what that knowledge looked like is, um, actually, you could you probably put that in the chat as well, um, what it is exactly you learned in terms of that content knowledge. One of the things that um, we've done is we've explored some ways of thinking about how history shows up amongst young people and how where the sources where they learn that history in particular black history knowledge in and specifically we see that school either during black history month which is common um, or in history class is where individuals most often or at least students most often learn about Black history. And one of the reasons we highlight this is to demonstrate the importance of educators when it comes to Black history knowledge, right? There are lots of other sources. Parents we can see are, are clear um, next source or caregivers in terms of what's happening in the home. Although when we look at the, the primary sources of where Black history knowledge is coming from, much of that is happening in the school context. And that is equally connected to when we think about well, what are the specific perceptions that individuals have of Black history knowledge? What actually is represented by Black history? And actually, if folks want to put in, in the chat what they initially learned about Black history. So this is a question that I actually often ask of people. So when you learned about Black history, what is it that you actually learn? And when I ask this question of participants who engage in surveys or do focus groups, oftentimes uh, people will say that Black history is about one of two things. African enslavement or slavery and the civil rights movement, right? And you just um, had some, you just had that uh, exemplified right there. In the chat. Chat. <laughs> That's exactly what they it's say. Right. It's yes. like slavery and, and it, civil rights. Yeah. It happens every time, right? Mm -hmm. And it demonstrates a really sort of narrow or myopic focus around what black history actually is. And so today we're going to do a little bit of expanding of that definition. We see to a lesser degree that black history knowledge or parts of black history knowledge is, is talked about in terms of the Nguzu Saba, which is also known as the seven principles or Kwanzaa, um, or the Ma'afa, which is um, another way of talking about African enslavement that refers to the African Holocaust, right? And so we want to give some variability to the way that um, we're conceptualizing black history knowledge. And that variability is what we found really connects to the psychosocial development piece, the piece that you all are talking about really valuing as educators. So let's talk about what this Black History Knowledge thing is. We're going to give let's you a little definition, a little content here. Mm -hmm. So there's six pieces that we're going to talk. You see these puzzle pieces appearing. They will appear in various 
spaces in this um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, I this had is a lot of fun. Haunt, with <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Colette is a fan of animation, <laughs> uh, you can't tell. But this comes from um, a really poignant work that she did um, with another colleague, Dr. Adams Bass, um, that just explained and conceptualized Black history knowledge in a really great and novel way. So um, whereas what you all are really echoing in the chat, this idea around, um, well, there were people in Africa at one point, and then they were slaves, and then they weren't in the 60s and then slavery and civil rights, all that ended and now it's 2020. That's, that's sometimes people's black history knowledge um, in a nutshell. What we're proposing here is that there are actually six different areas in which you can discuss black history knowledge, all of which probably should be discussed at points. Um, so Scott said, yeah, that's his knowledge. There you go. <laughs> so there's more. Uh, so we're gonna go, go right. into that. Um, one of the pieces in this puzzle um, known as Black History Knowledge, involves structural awareness. Now, this does have um, ties into African enslavement, right? But what we're focusing on here is the actual um, ripple effects of African enslavement in the uh, structure of American society. So we're looking at racism, yes, and we're looking at how racism manifests and what it might look like, but we're looking at that in more of a structural way because of the foundation um, of what happened in our country around um, being in a racialized society. This one, contributions and achievements, may be one of the more common ones that you've seen um, in your history um, of Black history knowledge or how you learned about it personally, maybe even how you teach it. So this is what you think it is. This is um, MLK had these kind of contributions. Rosa, Rosa Parks, Parks. Uh, the women from Hidden Figures, all of those kind of people that actually had were um, African folks and um, Black Americans have contributed to not just American society, but to the world in various ways, inventors, all these things, the typical Black History Month contributions. Black Wall Street, yes, Bianca is a wonderful mm -hmm. example. So that's the second one. And then the third one that I'll talk about is, is cultural strengths. So this idea that the, the Black culture in itself, the African-American culture actually possesses um, some real rich and helpful and hopeful um, aspects about itself. One example that I'll give you is this spirit of resiliency, um, this spirit to be able to continue to exist and endure despite a lot of societal oppression and racial oppression, um, that there are things about this culture that are actually worth learning from and emulating. That in itself is a narrative that counters um, the narrative from African enslavement but that gets a little bit ahead of myself. So Colette will tell us about the last three pieces. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrea. So um, to continue along, talking about this idea of capital positioning, it ties in actually with the structural awareness piece that Andrea was just talking about. And capital positioning looks more specifically at how history and contemporary political experiences, social experiences, and economic experiences shape the lives of Black Americans. And so when we're talking about this idea of capital positioning, we're really asking questions about, well, what does it mean to be a Black person in the United States of America? And not only how do I, as an individual who may um, exist as a Black person living with a Black phenotype, if you will, um, but also how do other people perceive that phenotype or that experience of what it means to be a Black American? Um, and that's sort of an example of the social element of the capital positioning piece. Um, we also see this idea of the global diasporic identity. And I will say that this particular part of um, Black history knowledge is, is important for me. And it's one that I um, harp on sometimes, but I will not do that this evening given time, um, in the sense that this is the part of uh, Black history knowledge that really reflects on how is it that Black people in the US or in the Americas are connected with other Black people throughout the history of the world, right? It acknowledges the cultural narratives and the unique cultural narratives, not only of Black Americans, but also how Black people exist in a global context. And so it takes out this idea of sort of monolithic notions of who Black folk are and really begins to um, explore how we think about the heterogeneity of Black of Black people. Um, the other thing that global diasporic identity also um, helps us begin to understand is who Black folk were prior to African enslavement. And that's a really important piece, 
right? And it actually leads into the last piece, which Andrea was alluding to, that being counter narratives. And counter narratives really focus on messages that debunk these deficit notions that are oftentimes associated with things like structural awareness and capital positioning. So as you can see, there are, there are these four pieces of this puzzle. Um, the global diasporic identity, contributions, achievements, counter narratives, and cultural strengths that really draw on um, what Dr. Joe White would talk about as the seven psychological strengths uh, of, of Black folk, right, which includes um, resilience and gallows humor and things like that. Uh, and you juxtapose that next to the structural awareness and capital positioning piece, which acknowledges um, sort of the hierarchical um, experiences and also oppression-based experiences that Black Americans um, in a U.S. context, of course, um, have, have had and have had to negotiate um, throughout history. And so what we're saying here is that all of these pieces actually contribute to the way that we think about and conceptualize Black history. It's not just one. So if we're going to talk about Black history, we really have to talk about how all of these pieces coalesce and that it is these um, pieces that come together that really begin to shape psychosocial experiences. So then, about the psychosocial experiences, how do we begin to think about how Black history is connected to psychosocial development? And so one of the reasons that um, we wanted to, to focus in on uh, the psychosocial development piece is really to um, bridge this idea that um, Black history and the way that people see themselves and others view them is not just about um, a, one particular group of people. Um, it's about the experiences of, of all individuals and the ways in which those individuals can begin to understand themselves and, and others. And so one of the questions we wanted to sort of pose, I think we got another poll, Andrea, mm -hmm. if I'm okay. Yeah. So one of the questions we wanted to, to pose is, you know, why might you feel it, it's necessary to even teach Black history knowledge? What's the point? So a lot of you, Black history is a part of history. Um, it's So what I'm assuming from that, and you all correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're saying to um, compartmentalize it or not to teach it is teaching an incomplete area um, or, or incomplete version of history um, and to include everyone, like Sarah is saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Great. absolutely. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so lots of people resonating with what you're saying, Andrea. Mm -hmm. um, Wonderful. So as we think about um, what you all are saying, and this notion that to teach black history is, is to teach history, right? Um, and we tie that with the values that you all are bringing into our uh, conversation this evening. I wanna talk a little bit about psychosocial development, particularly around positive youth development. So we're shifting gears a little bit so that we can make this bridge, right? So there's a model called the five C's model. Some of you may be familiar with the five C's. We're gonna focus in particular on two of the five C's this evening, competence and confidence. And really this model is a, is a framework around a positive youth development that attends to or outlines the psychological, behavioral and social uh, characteristics that are um, related to how youth thrive um, and how youth can become um, what we talk about is good citizens or contributing citizens, right? And so um, Lerner actually added a 6C to this model um, or this model, the five pieces actually result in the 6C um, known as contribution that's contributing to the self, contributing to community and contributing to society. So when we look particularly at the two that we'll be focusing on tonight, that being competence and confidence, um, Competence really focuses on um, how students are building um, sort of positive views of themselves and their actions, the way that they're moving through the world and engaging in the world. So when someone said in the chat, I'm going to, I'm trying to go get back to it um, to make Black students feel proud. Where was that, Dre? Uh, right a little bit um, above, let's see. Is that Valerie? Val oh, Valerie. Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when Valerie mentioned this, this notion of to, to help um, black students feel proud. That really fits well with this competence idea, right? Um, there is something about having a positive view of the self as a student that really very much contributes to 
how people move through the world as adults, right? And how they contribute to society and contribute to their own communities. Additionally, focusing on this confidence piece, confidence is reflective of how students feel a sense of success or how people feel a sense of success and the way that that positive sense of self or self-worth is connected to um, efficacy and the way that um, people tend to engage with opportunities that may come their way or the way that they may even interact in the classroom setting, um, which we know has implications for the way that they'll interact in other kinds of settings, such as when they are much later out in the workforce, et cetera. And the last three pieces, I won't go over um, so specifically for the sake of time, but I, what I will note is that when we're talking about connection, character, and caring, uh, those three pieces really focus on the ways in which um, individuals find um, opportunity to connect with uh, family members, to connect with school leaders, and through those processes, they're developing and um, how they're respecting um, one another. So there's both intrapersonal and interpersonal interactions there, and that speaks to the character piece. And the last piece, um, caring really has to do with the way that students are developing empathy and compassion. And so we touch on that last piece a little bit too, uh, it kind of inherently in touching on the competence and confidence pieces of this. Andrew, do you wanna add anything there? No, I think that's great. Uh, it's a good segue to talk about um, some of the social identity development that's happening here. You know, uh, part of what I do in addition to my faculty role is I will uh, serve as a consultant or guest speaker for uh, various companies or entities, um, organizations who desire to improve their diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging practices. And um, I've done several of those webinars and workshops as of late. And, and I always start those talks with what is the point of this? Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. And I always say, for myself, I think there's two reasons to do that. People are hurting and children are learning. And I think that the latter here is what we can focus on when we're talking about social identity development because children will learn. They're learning from you even if you don't own them, even if you're not um, someone who plans to have children, they're looking, they're observing, they're concluding things. And the thing about those, that kid logic is what I like to say, um, is that it's oftentimes inaccurate um, because of their limited scope on the world and their limited cognitive abilities, but it always feels true and it's very long lasting. So if you can think for yourself about conclusions that you've drawn about yourself, about who you are, what you offer to the world, who you are to your family members, what it means to be a woman or a man or part of a racial group, some of that stuff comes from that elementary, middle school, high school years, it has those ripple effects, right? Even though you've got cognitive knowledge as an adult, that kid logic still stays. That's what makes your jobs so critical and so important because you have these kids like putty in your hands while they are developing this racial identity and this thing we call gender identity as well, okay? Um, the formulation of this based on, on research that you don't care about right now, um, <laughs> is, is based on a lot of things. Um, parents are huge, I, you know that. Um, but there's a lot of other people that are huge as well, especially when we get into teenage years, um, peers start to be a huge source of, of influence, but also what they're watching, okay? Um, a lot of research shows that teenagers uh, learn from what they see and what they see depends on what they watch, right? But here's the other part that's very critical is the educators and the education. That helps formulate identity. So it makes your job even more crucial. And I love what you all um, expressed in that first poll. Mm -hmm. And what's represented in research here um, is that when you first learn about Black history, these places that you're learning from, um, those are very critical aspects in formulating thoughts. For yes, some of the kids of color, some of the black kids in the room, but for all of the kids in the room, especially, they're formulating who am I? Who am I in relation to other people? Who am I? Here's where intersectionality, if you're not familiar with that, look up Kimberly Crenshaw, you'll love it. Yes, intersectionality is all of this. <laughs> right. I, I don't know if I've ever talked about anything ever without mentioning intersectionality, but um, who you are as a black man, who you are as a black woman or black girl, um, as an Asian American man or, or or woman, whatever that looks like for you. 
um, that gets influenced not only by your parents, not only by what you're watching, not only by your friends, but by the education that you receive and the educators that are giving it to you. Absolutely. And so here's where we're coming in when you're polled, um, when you said, you know, it's more about student development than it is about facts and figures. Well, yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, not only in a technical sense, but in a psychological sense as well. Mm-hmm. You want to add anything to that, uh, Colette? No, because it's a perfect segue into the reality is, is like we see it. Right. So um, when we talk with students and when we engage with students a- across levels. Right. And so we're talking about from K through sort of collegiate or um, post-secondary education years. Um, we see that this knowledge has an impact on the way that people see themselves, see themselves in community, experience the world. And so we have two just quick quotes here to share with you um, from participants in a study that was conducted some time ago. Um, One participant shared, you know, I learned we're a big part of American history. The only part and the only part that, that they teach us about in school was, oh, we got y'all, y'all came here. We used y'all to help cultivate and start this great land and we treated y'all bad. And this really resonates with something that someone mentioned earlier in the chat and that um, sort of summary that Andrea shared about how history is presented, particularly how black history is presented. And it's really a limited perspective of what Black history is. And that limited perspective, just as Andrea was saying, shapes who people experience themselves to be. It shapes how people understand their communities. And so we sort of juxtapose that with this notion of when people learn about themselves and learn a full picture of what Black history is, right, those six pieces and more, You know, we see things like community perpetuity. I feel as a result of these courses, and in this case, the the folks are speaking to Black history courses, um, that we have the resources and the information to actually bring about change and take action. I feel like now I can speak up about something or start something based upon what I've learned. So, wow, we're already seeing that competence and that confidence come through in a quote like this one. Did you want to add anything there, Dre? didn't realize I was muted. Um, I'm going to ask you to go back to our six puzzle pieces really quickly. I I just want to connect some dots explicitly. Um, So when we're talking about these six pieces, I want you all to just reflect for a bit if there's any pieces that are missing from your dissemination of knowledge in the classroom. Um, Because if there is some holes here, if we're only focusing on the structural awareness, hey, racism is real. This is how bad it was. This is what African enslavement did there's a certain type of conclusion that especially your kids of color are going to draw. Um, right. Even the kids about, who hold- Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, because that, that sort of sets up this narrative of we're responding or we're reacting to racism, right? My entire identity is about reacting to racism. Who I mm-hmm. am is shaped by how much I don't want to experience racism. <laughs> Sure, yeah. And even if you've got a room full of white American students, um, part of their knowledge around Black history is limited because it might even inadvertently perpetuate ideas around Black inferiority. Because there's a pity there and like, ooh, that really sucks. They were slaves and then they were segregated and now there weren't. That's kind of, they didn't really offer much to the world. Wrong, what's wrong is that you have an incomplete Black history knowledge piece here. Um, So emphasis on the cultural strengths or maybe more achievements um, or that diasporic identity. Reflect on your teaching and and if there's ways in which you might need to add or or decrease levels of one of these six puzzle pieces in order to foster the type of um, racial identity or gender identity that you might want your kids to have. You're not the only source as we already talked about, but there is something that's very impactful when you have this complete picture. Absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful point, Andrea. So, you know, um, and Andrea's actually already started to touch on some of these pieces. So what is it that we can learn from Black history knowledge that's really affecting students' experiences? Well, one, and this is what Andrea just talked about, is this sort of persistence of isms. Yes, racism is real and sexism and um, classism, and we, we can go through a whole host of isms or oppression-based experiences. One of the things, though, that can be drawn as a heuristic from Black history knowledge is that 
there's a way that those isms are perpetuated. There's a way that those isms continue. And we can see that by the way that history is even presented in our classes, right? And so we wanna be thoughtful about, you know, as Andrea just mentioned, well, what are some of those pieces that may be presented more or less in the way that you're engaging and talking about black history? Or if you're not talking about any of the pieces at all, like what is that about and where is that coming from? And sometimes I think we have to ask sort of challenging questions as educators is, is how am I contributing to this sort of persistence or perpetuation of some type of ism in my presentation of a particular topic area? Um, we can also see that Black history knowledge helps us think about the importance of self and community. And we've sort of talked about that in a number of ways, but want to just kind of reiterate it here. Um, additionally, want to note that Black history knowledge really allows for this opportunity to, to do some critical analysis that helps folks engage in a community. And so we saw some of that in the quote um, around what the students shared around community perpetuity. But the other piece is that when you think about the various components of Black history knowledge, it really allows for us to think holistically about the, the history of a group of people and how that history, both historically, if you will, and contemporarily shapes the experiences of a whole host of individuals. You know, I actually I love a quote by, um, Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart, um, who does a lot of work around historical trauma in uh, Native Indigenous populations. And the, the quote goes, I'm going to sort of paraphrase it, but the quote goes something like, everything up until a second ago is history. And one of the reasons I love that quote so much is because it really gives us a sense of like where we are situated as educators as where you all are situated as, as, as educators at a particular point in time and how you are contributing to the individual and collective histories of your students, right? Um, and Black history knowledge um, really gives us a way to begin talking about that and unpacking that a bit. And finally, it really illustrates that um, it's a way that when confronting oppression, it really benefits everybody. Right. This is not something that is unique specifically to Black Americans. Yes, it's it's the history of um, African descended people as the um, those individuals exist in the Americas. But it's not to say that that history um, is solely connected to a Black individuals. Right. And so we're talking about systems of oppression. There's benefit there for every person. Absolutely, I think that's really well said. And I'll point out also before we transition to our next subject, I really appreciate some of the transparency and vulnerability you all have in the chat, just um, actually doing what I asked and reflecting on Wonderful. Um, ways that you can continue to um, learn and grow and broaden your experience of black history knowledge in the classroom. I appreciate everybody's um, comments there.